Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 73, in which Caitlin interviews Dr. Kenneth Catania of Vanderbilt University, Nashville, Tennessee, all about sensory structures. But before we start, we've got plenty of admin to cover. Firstly, a big apology for the recent lack of interviews. 2017 has proven pretty difficult, whether it be finding a mutually convenient time with an interviewee, or even finding time amongst our own hectic schedules. But after this episode, we've already got two more recorded, so we shouldn't have any more gaps for a while. Secondly, if you hadn't already seen it, we've set up a blog on our website, so that's even more paleo content on its way to you, just in written form. Our website was already set up for blogging, so we just thought, hey, why not? So, if you're a paleontologist and fancy writing something for the blog and our audience, please send me an email with your ideas, dave at paleocast.com. Thirdly, we've got our Paleocast art competition on the horizon, and we're looking for some donations of prizes for our winners. We've had great engagement with this every year, and the competition just keeps on getting bigger and better. So, if you make or supply any paleo-related goodies, please get in touch. Lastly, you may have noticed the temporary absence of our website again. Well, we got hacked again, and you may have been thinking that the security improvements we made after the last hack were enough. Well, they weren't, so it'll be down for maybe a week, maybe two, I don't know, but it should be back before we know it. In the meantime, we've still got the usual pictures and plenty of videos to accompany this episode just on our Facebook page. Uh, That's Facebook forward slash Paleocast. And so with all of that out of the way, I think uh, that this is a great interview, and so if you agree, please give us a boost on social media and any reviews on iTunes would be greatly appreciated. We'll be back on the 1st of April, either with some hydrodynamics or some early archosaurs, and so we'll see you then. Kenneth Catania is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Vanderbilt University, where he and his lab study animal sensory systems with a focus on brain organization, evolution, and behavior. Hi there, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. All right, so I think we should start with our little disclaimer that you are not a paleontologist. You're a neuroscientist and a biologist, but like a lot of paleontologists I know, you study living animals in order to understand how they evolved. What is your background exactly? Yeah, so my background is pretty diverse, I guess. I've always had an interest in animal diversity. I was a what you used to call a zoology student. Um, that was really just the name for the biology department back in that time. Uh, so I, I had a lot of interest in animal diversity. I worked at the zoo as a volunteer for a while and that had a major impact. And then I got interested in animal sensory systems and one of the best programs of study to get into that field was neurosciences. And so I got my degree in my graduate degree in neurosciences at UCSD initially thinking it would be maybe electric fish but ending up studying unusual mammals which was kind of a a fun project yeah that's awesome all right we're going to talk about that in a second but I wanted to just ask you before we really get into your research what would you be doing if you were not a scientist that is always a tough question to try to second guess things Um, there were lots of possibilities Uh, I used to ride horses at a Renaissance festival, so (laughs) that's that's a possibility. (laughs) Um, But probably more professionally, I would have tried, I imagine, because I did think about this, uh, uh, wildlife photography and and writing uh, would have been really attractive to me. Whether or not you can make a career doing that, uh, I don't know, know, without more experience. Yeah, well, you do a lot of that in your career now anyways, right? I do, so so it really helped that I almost tried to do that because it's been helpful for documenting all the stuff that we do. Cool. All right. Well, let's get started talking about what you do. So what makes up an animal's sensory system and how much variation do you see in animals living today? That's a fascinating question because the first answer would usually be thinking about the senses that we have. Eyes, ears, nose, olfaction, the skin, sense of smell, and certainly those are things, those are the kinds of things that we definitely explore. But then there's other things that we don't really have, like echolocation, you know, sort of extremes in the auditory system, modifications of the auditory system. 
electroreception to detect electric fields. So those are, I think, are some of the most fascinating, partly because they're different, so we can only imagine what it's like to have that. But it also tells us that there may be other things that we have yet to discover, and we should keep a really open mind, not only about the animals living today, but also about the animals that lived in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So you said weird animals or weird mammals. What do you mean by that exactly? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the star nose mole was sort of my first research project. And I do think that it's fair to characterize that as a weird animal. Definitely. If nobody's seen a star nose mole before, we'll put up a picture on the website so you can check him out. He's yeah. a weird looking guy. Right. And if I had a, a, a wish related to paleontology, it would be I wish that the nose fossilized because oh, yeah. how did you get 22 appendages on the face of an animal? I mean, all, our research and some of the mutations that you see or that abnormalities suggest, of course, that and some comparative studies of other animals that it certainly started with fewer and gained appendages by duplications over time. But I would really love to know how that happened mm -hmm. in, in not just a comparative framework, but a, a sort of ancestral framework. Absolutely. And what does it use the appendages for? Well, you might guess uh, smell, but that's not what it's for. Because, huh. you know, like the tip of our nose doesn't smell, is not for smell. So right. it's for touch. It's about the most sensitive touch organ of any creature, certainly any mammal on the planet. Wow. has five times more nerve fibers in it than the whole human hand, and it's com that's compacted into the, the size of your fingertip. If you want to imagine what would it be like to be five times more sensitive in just your fingertip than your whole hand. And of course, humans are legendary or you know thought to have evolved to our, our specialties partly because our hands are so sensitive, yeah. so that gets you some imagination there. That's so cool. And is it only star-nosed moles that have these sort of appendages, or do other moles have stuff like that? And there's a mole that I found that I call the Archaeopteryx of moles uh -huh. that's got an intermediate pseudo-star on it. Um, oh. And that was a really, and amazingly that looks fairly similar to embryonic star-nosed moles. Oh. So there's this whole development evolution relationship story that you can sort of think about there. So there's good evidence for where that came from. So, but there's nothing that's quite like the appendages. There's some precursor-like structures uh, in other species. Cool, that's super cool. Um, okay, so you also study brains. You're obviously yeah. a neuroscientist. Yeah. So how is that related to studying sensory systems? Yeah, so the, the you know, brains are absolutely fascinating because they sort of run the show when it comes to behavior. And they are very, in many, in most species, their organization is tightly coupled with sensory systems. So, for example, our brains have a huge amount of tissue devoted to vision because we're very visual creatures. Mm -hmm. And in a, the star nose mole, a huge amount of tissue is devoted to the star to the representation of the star and processing information from there. If you go to echolocating bats, it's just dominated by auditory cortex for analyzing echoes. And within that general theme, then you get some really interesting specializations, like in the star nose mole, you can actually see the star pattern in the neocortex, and the neocortex is that outer folded sheet that we have. It's not folded in a, in a mole, but all mammals have neocortex, only mammals have neocortex. and one of the things we try to understand in neurosciences is how are the sensory systems represented. So it's really nice to see the representation in the anatomy uh, when you stain the tissue. And it allows for lots of interesting measurements and, and understanding how it develops and connections and lots of things That's like that. That's so cool. So what sort of methods do you use to study the brain? You said staining. Yeah, so we do the standard kind of neuroanatomy thing where you would section up the tissue and use various cellular stains to look at how are the cells organized, where do the neurons project, uh, where is the metabolic activity most uh, obvious, most highest, um, so mitochondrial stains for that. And then we will record from neurons with electrodes and anesthetized animals to map things out, sort of like Wilder Penfield did to figure out the human brain mm -hmm. organization during surgeries. And so really a, a, a wide, com you, you need a wide combination of techniques to understand the brain. You, you really can't usually use just one, I mean, you can use one, but the most information comes from using as many techniques as possible because the brain's super complicated yeah. <laughs> and to this day there's lots of arguments about what you would think we would know everything about already um, so the more techniques the more ways you can approach that with as much power uh, the better for a full understanding 
And how do you go about studying the evolution of the brain? That seems like that would be such a crazy, yeah. huge task. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are endocasts or so-called you know, fossilized brains when the skull fills, and those can be incredibly useful because sometimes you can see markers for specific brain structures, and you would think the neocortex would not be part of that, but actually there's something called a rhinal sulcus, which divides this neocortex. And, you know, I say neocortex partly because we're human-centric and we're really, at least a lot of people are when it comes to neurosciences and we want to understand our brains and how they evolved often. And so understanding how big the neocortex is is something you can get from fossils in the relative proportions. But the bigger theme is that you can't tell internal organization, obviously. You can get some outer landmarks, but you don't know what's going on inside. And for those, those aspects, the, the only real approach is comparative studies and, and trying to find out what was the most likely common ancestor have had from the distribution of traits that we see in existing animals. And so part of what my lab does, sort of a theme that's underlying other studies, is to gather as much comparative data about the way modern brains are organized so that people can reconstruct the likely history and the likely common traits that an ancestral mammal might have had. That's so cool. And then you can figure out things like their sensory systems and things like yeah. that if you can understand the brain. Yeah. You can make some inferences. And yeah. Yes. That's awesome. That's so cool. Um, so uh, my next question was actually, do you ever include fossils in your work? So do you ever look at fossils yourself? I talk about fossil findings of other folks, but I don't. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe that would be a, a tentative yes. So in some of the papers, particularly uh, one of the questions I'm really interested in is what were the earliest mammals like? Mm -hmm. And some of the fossils suggest that they were tiny shrew-like creatures. Right. And since we study shrews, um, you know, there's an interesting link there. How tight that link is, you know, is is, is probably take finding a lot more fossils to work yeah. things out. But it's a dangerous but interesting thing to try to learn about ancestral species from modern species because the modern species aren't the ancestor. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's the best thing we have. Yeah. And so in that sense, I am intrigued with shrews. And related to that, the shrews are amazing. You know, people want to people who haven't looked at their behavior sort of think of them as the Model T Ford of mammals, and that's completely wrong. Uh, they do amazing things. They're the fastest animals I've ever worked with. Uh, a water shrew can find food underwater at night. Uh, we can't do that, <laughs> you know, no um, without using eyesight. Wow. Um, and so they're remarkable in very many ways, and there's some advantages to having small brains. Yeah. Um, when you think about a computer, one of your big problems is processing speed. Mm -hmm. And the brains have that problem too. And when your brain is small, that processing speed, because the connections are short, can be extremely high. So those are some unthought of things that, and I do think about, I mean, I do sometimes think about dinosaurs, dinosaur eggs, and these shrew creatures that I look at, I, I can't keep up with them. I don't know if dinosaurs could have. So anyway, there's some neat connections to think about. Yeah, that's so cool. Wow. Um, okay, so what sort of research is going on in your lab at Vanderbilt right now? What kind of other animals are you guys looking at? Well, as you may have recently heard, I'm kind of obsessed with electric eels right now. Yes. Um, and that project really stemmed from uh, what was going to be a writing project, but stumbling into the some very interesting things that the electric eels were doing, and changing from writing to research, uh, and that you know I won't cover that in, in I won't talk about that in a lot of detail except to say, amazingly, after hundreds of years of looking at electric eels, people hadn't really examined their behavior, mm -hmm. and they turn out to have. An incredible set of behaviors and I'll just say that um, that theme is true for every animal that I study and you'd think I'd have learned that lesson by now which is that while maybe this animal isn't doing much interesting like the shrews or the eels or some other species they're always doing something much more interesting than I ever could have guessed yeah Okay, well, I definitely want to talk about electric eels a little bit more because okay. your talk yesterday was so cool. And you just said you had so many videos and it was just amazing to actually hear the electricity that the eel makes. And yeah. I, they're just, they're so much more exciting than I was expecting. And I guess I hadn't thought about electric eels a lot before, but now I want to know everything about them. So um, 
they actually eels have a really a pretty decent fossil record but the electric eel isn't actually an eel at all is it yeah it's not a freshwater i guess an anguilliform eel as you might think of that group um, it is rather an electric fish in this gymnotiform uh, group of fishes from south america and uh, most of those, or a lot of those, are really small, delicate, nocturnal species that probe their worlds with weak electric fields. And I made the joke yesterday that I think is a good sort of way of thinking it, that the eel went down the weapons of mass destruction pathway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because its electric organ is huge. It's really daunting, um, hundreds of volts of electricity. And of course, you know, that has fascinated people for hundreds of years. Yeah. And they have been a really important so-called model for understanding the basics of how ion channels work. So mm-hmm. the acetylcho- the acetylcholine receptor that mediates muscle movements was isolated first in those guys. So they've been a very useful system and a very interesting system going back hundreds of years. I mean, Faraday messed around with them to try to understand electricity. Yeah. So the behavior is sort of the icing on the cake. You know, not only is their physiology incredible that they can generate electricity with their body. Something yeah. if a, if an electric eel didn't exist and I said it could, people would say that's not possible. It's crazy. But it does exist yeah. and that's amazing. And so you know, how it evolved, yeah. why it evolved, what it uses this system for, all of those are really interesting questions. Yeah, so how did it evolve? How does something like that evolve? You don't really know. Okay. Um, you know, I say that, but the evolution of that group of fishes is not my specialty show, so I should be a little bit cautious there. So there's a lot of great, you know, scientists working on that kind of a problem. I could speculate a little bit about it. Clearly, you know, so one possibility is the sensory system to get further range with the electric sense. They might have increased the voltage of their output, and that would slowly increase the range which they could detect things. And by that mechanism, they could have stumbled into a weapon. Um, that's one possibility. Another related thing could be the rate at which they give off pulses. There's something in neurosciences called temporal summation, which is basically you can, instead of being more powerful in the moment of a pulse, you can add up pulses that might activate a nerve or a muscle as a weapon. And so those two things acting together might have been the precursors, but that's very speculative. Yeah. yeah. And so they are low voltage and have high voltage, yeah. right? So yes. the high voltage is the weapon that you're talking about, yes. and then low voltage is a sensory thing? Yes. Okay. Well, and I should say uh, the low voltage has been known to be a sensory thing for some time. One of the recent findings uh, from the lab is that the high voltage is a sensory thing too. Uh huh. So that's that's amazing in lots of ways because it means the trait of high voltage is both a weapon and a sensor simultaneously, which is pretty amazing. Wow, that's really, really cool. Um, okay, so this is, I think, kind of an obvious question. How does the eel avoid shocking itself? Do we understand how that works? I don't think it's well understood. I haven't really looked into it. There seems to be some older literature suggesting that they're protecting some of the nerve endings with more sort of insulating uh, mechanisms. Um, but my guess would be, in general, you sort of just think to the physics of electric circuits that there must be areas of insulation and areas of uh, least resistance that the electric path would take in you know for the for the eel. Okay, um, and so you told this story about from the 1800s. Was it Humboldt? Yes. Who went fishing for electric eels with horses, and this has sort of been this like yeah. tall tale yeah. of yeah. exhausting the eels with horses yeah. to catch them. Yes. And people never really knew if this was true or not. Yeah. And you got really interested in this. So why did you get really interested in this story? You know, in my studies, I try to let the animals lead the way. So I did not look up this story and say I want to investigate this story. What happened was. I was using a metal net to move the eels around and the eels have an electric sense and interpret metal as living beings because it's conductive and they'll try to eat small bits of metal Um, but what about big metal things that are sort of partly in the water well they attacked them when they were cornered Um, and if you're keeping an eel in a lab it's almost always cornered because it's in an aquarium and so these eels would aggressively defend themselves by leaping up the net and shocking. And the interpretation would be they've encountered a large living thing that's approaching them that's potentially even a terrestrial creature that's in their area, which is sort of all the hallmarks of a big predator. And so, or something maybe that might step on them, who knows, or something that might damage their nest with young in it, which is they do apparently defend 
they're young. So um, this behavior, it turns out, ultimately seemed to relate back to Humboldt's story because the pieces of the puzzle that came together is with the wet season and the dry season in the Amazon, sometimes the electric eels are trapped so they can't necessarily flee. Um, they would likely be subject pr to predation if a predator wasn't fully in the water because that means it's hard for the eel to shock it. So there's all the sort of reasons for some sort of defense to be needed and sh they sure enough they have it. So uh, this leaping out of the water behavior, it turns out, is something that almost certainly happened with Humboldt's encounter with the horses. Yeah. And then you showed us a video of yeah. something that happened recently, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, not only can you simulate this with prop animals where the eels will leap up and light up the props that I put diodes in, but there is a video out there that shows a person recently have, having an encounter with an eel in, you know, in, in South America where it does leap out and shock him. And uh, so... It's kind of terrifying yeah, kind and of terrifying. awesome at the same time. It is, yeah. And the person was fine yeah. at the end of that. Right. So you know, <laughs> uh, probably we'll think twice about getting in the water with an eel again. Though. Yeah, I think that's probably wise. Yeah. Um, is there an animal that you haven't gotten a chance to study yet that you're interested in? I would love to look at sharks uh, at some point, but that's a difficult animal care issue. Yeah. You know, how do you get the university to agree to, you know, how's a great white shark for you? Yeah. And at first, um, that seems insane, and it, it kind of is. But, you know, the juveniles are pretty small. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would have said that about electric eels at some point. Um, sharks are, are sort of uh, on the wish list, but I don't realistically think I'll ever look at them. Um, and... You know, who knows what would what else would be next? Yeah, is there no way you could get like a boat and just go out to the wild <laughs> and hang out with sharks for well, a while? Well, I get kind of seasick, so okay. it's probably it's not probably the best not. one for okay. me. I'd probably be have to be drugged up, and who knows whether my judgment <laughs> yeah, would be good. At that it's point. probably not ideal. Um, what's something that's truly surprised you in the course of your research? Everything has surprised. Every animal has surprised me. Um, the starnose moles turn out to be the fastest foragers among mammals. They're in the Guinness Book of World Records uh, based on one of our papers. Uh, so that was surprising. Their brains are surprising. The eels were surprising. We studied tentacled snakes to learn about the tentacles, but they have a predatory trick that was really unexpected where they can sort of scare fish into their own mouths. When I was looking at water shrews trying to catch prey underwater, uh, they did something people thought was impossible, but I thought was impossible. They learned, they could use smell underwater by, and they do this by exhaling air bubbles and reinhaling the same air bubbles. And you can only see this if you film them in slow motion underwater, which you know not many people do. No. So, so all of the animals have been surprising, and I think that's great because it means that even things that we've studied, and I would sort of say this to people thinking about biology or in biology. Even, even the animals that you might think have already been explored surely still have surprises to, to tell us about. And a part of that is modern technology. Uh, you know, we can do so much with slow motion cameras and modern photography equipment and modern data collection techniques to readdress really kind of old systems and find new things. Yeah, that's awesome. So how do you think your research can be used by paleontologists to study extinct animals? I do think it can be in in maybe two broad senses, you know, one sense is some very specific things like um, neural tracts uh, that are sometimes in bone. So we were talking about this yesterday mm -hmm. for crocodilians and one of my students had studied the sensory system of the skin surface and scales on crocodilians. And it does turn out that the jaw underneath that has all these basically holes in which the nerves travel. And, you know, then you can sort of extrapolate, well, if these are nerve pathways, which are probably there to be protecting, to protect the nerves while, you know, crocodilians go about doing their sort of violent behaviors, mm -hmm. either to other animals or each other. Um, you know, that's a very specific example of getting some insights about bones and nerve pathways that one, maybe tell us a strategy for protecting the nerves, and two, if you look at just simply the size of those nerve pathways, you can start to infer things about where was maybe the sensory surfaces most important to this animal. And I think that's great, because it lets you at least start to make some better guesses about behavior if you can kind of get an idea about 
of what where an animal sort of focuses its sensory systems. But in the broader other sort of sense, I think one possibility is to keep a very open mind because if if I've been doing this for most of my career and I still can't guess accurately about what an animal can do, um, we should probably keep a very open mind about what an animal was doing hundreds of millions of years ago. Yeah. Um, and so that's just a cautionary tale sure. or maybe an exciting tale, mm -hmm. depending on how you think of it. Yeah, it's hard when you start with the end of the story and try to work your way back yeah. and figure out how it started, but yeah. we keep trying. Yeah. Um, all right, so just to close everything up, I have one last question for you. If you could have a sixth sense from the animals that you've studied, is there one that you would really like to have? I think it would be electroreception. Why? because it's the most foreign to us of the ones that I've studied and so of course because we don't have it and we don't have anything like we can kind of imagine what echolocation is like because we at least can hear but to detect electric fields with your own radar system that that's a pretty interesting so-called superpower yeah. you know <laughs> um, so that would be fun to have and if you added in the ability to have it your own personal taser when you were annoyed <laughs> um you know that would be that would be a fun one that would be awesome all right well thank you so much for talking to me today uh, you're welcome that was fun Paleocast was brought to you by dave marshall with joe keating laura soul liz martin silverstone and caitlin colary it was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast, and like us at facebook.com forward slash paleocast to get all the latest news.